name a person who's connected with them, Moses or Solomon or David. But when you actually read the text with your radar up for, oh, how did this book come into existence? What you find is, oh, even a book that has someone's name at the front doesn't mean that they themselves wrote the whole thing at one go. For example, the book of Proverbs. The first line of the book of Proverbs says, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And you go on to read a series of speeches from a father to a son. And you're like, oh, this is Solomon. Solomon wrote this book. Why wouldn't you think that? That's what the first line of the book says. Until you get to chapter 22. And there's a collection of poems there that say, these are the sayings of the wise ones. You're like, who are the wise ones? <laughs> who are they? I don't know. Then you get to chapter 25 and it says, oh, here's some more Proverbs of Solomon. Okay, well, that's what it said at the beginning. But they were compiled by the men of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And if you're a Bible history nerd, you know that Solomon and Hezekiah are separated by 200 years. So we're talking about a collection of Solomon's poetry and Proverbs that were not a part of edition one. <laughs> and they sat somewhere else for 200 years until the scribes of Hezekiah put them in. And then the last two chapters are the best. Chapter 30 begins with this heading, the sayings of Agur, son of Yaqeh. Who's that? Who's Agur? <laughs> Who's Agur? It's the only time in all of ancient literature he's ever mentioned. And he wrote a chapter of the Bible. <laughs> it's even better. The last chapter of the book, the sayings of King Lemuel. Who's that? Never heard of him. Anyway, and it's not even his own work, it's what his mom taught him. <laughs> and, and with all seriousness, right, the final scribe who's formed all of this together can look you in the face and begin this book with a line that says, oh, this is the Proverbs of Solomon. That's what this book is. Like he's not like, oh, I forgot, there's a thing from Lemuel. Like it's that's ridiculous. Are you with me? This is, this is a book that, that began life with Solomon's brilliance and wisdom, but went through many stages of composition and editing and so on until it came into its final form. We go through every book of the Hebrew Bible and tell a similar story, and it's amazing. It's fascinating. And what's especially fascinating why the Dead Sea Scrolls were so significant was because there's a handful of books, Jeremiah, Samuel, uh, Ezekiel, that's what I did my dissertation on here, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, the book of Daniel. There's n a number of books who, that there, you can still see in the Dead Sea Scrolls different editions, a longer edition, a shorter edition. There were multiple editions even of these books that still coexisted until they were brought together in, in their final shape. And it's so amazing. It's beautiful and it's incredible. And these, these are the texts that Jesus said point to him that bear witness to him, and this is the Bible. Now, let me just do one last thing. If, if so again, don't think about this technology of the, the codex that we encounter. Think of how Jesus encountered his Bible, a collection of scrolls, and you're raised with this awareness that all these scrolls exist in three collections. And if, if you look at the final sentences of the Pentateuch scroll, which would be the last sentences of Deuteronomy, you'll notice that the last three verses look like a little sticky note added on to the story, because they tell you about the death of Moses. He certainly didn't write that. And then they also tell you, dear reader, you know, no prophet like Moses has ever come among us. And you're like, well, okay. So that's somebody who's like way down the line who's reflecting back on Israel's ancient history from like somewhere, are you with me? And saying, dear reader, no prophet like Moses ever came. Then you read the first paragraph of Joshua, and Joshua is meant to be not just an army general, but a Torah scholar, like a Bible nerd, who's supposed to read the scriptures all of the time. And then if you look at the last, par the last three verses of the scroll of the prophets, which is the book of Malachi, it's another little sticky note. I call these prophetic sticky notes, right? Or editorial sticky notes. And it reads very similar to the end, like the sticky note at the end of uh, the book of Deuteronomy. And then if you look at the first beginning of the scroll of the third collection, it's the book of Psalms, and you read the first sentences of Psalm 1, they correspond exactly to the sticky note at the beginning of, are you with me? 
This is called Signs of Intelligent Life. Right? Signs of Intelligent Editorial Life. The whole Hebrew Bible has been edited together at a late phase in its composition into one beautiful, beautiful unified whole with a coherent message that G when Jesus started hearing these texts read aloud to them, and however this process happened with Jesus, he became aware by his adult age that these were about him, that these were about his calling and his identity. And these, these, the Hebrew Bible was telling a story that he was supposed to bring to its completion. And that's precisely, uh, we're, as we're going to see, what Jesus thought the Hebrew Bible was, a unified story that, that led to him and that he was going to do something to repair the broken covenant relationship between God and Israel and all of the nations. How you guys doing? It's just a, there you go. That's a very Socratic course.